Okay, hi everyone. How's it going? <laughs> Did you have a good weekend? I hope people went to Apple Fest. It was wickedly crowded. Yeah, I think it's a combination of COVID and um, yeah. being one day. Um, so these are the latest statistics. Uh, I, I happen to know that everybody got to the week two checkout. So I think this is just an old uh, deprecated score. But in any case, uh, the new leaders are O. Boyd with 200 Boyds followed closely behind by one Boyd to rule them all. So we will see how this looks after this week, but uh, it's getting interesting. The statistics are getting interesting. I have a, just a couple sort of logistic things to go over before I get into, I'm gonna start talking about lab three today. The first one is I am, I am working through your lab one lab reports. There's a lot to get through, which is why it's taken me a little while and your TAs have been super helpful with this, but I promise to get them back to you by Wednesday so that the Wednesday groups have them back for a full week as they work on their lab two reports. So I'll get them back to you by Wednesday, probably not before, just because there's a lot to read through. Um, overall, they look really good, actually, I will say. I did see one pattern that I wanted to just talk about. Um, and this is something, this has to do with the way that folks wired their switch to switch between play mode and record mode. And it's something that wouldn't probably, it'd be very unlikely for this to cause a bug in lab one, in the lab that we were doing. But if you were to wire up a switch in a different project where you were reading that switch at a slightly different speed, it may cause you issues. So I wanna just mention it. And it's this where we had a single pull double throw switch. So we had, uh, let's see. The way I saw a lot of people hook up their switch was they took the center pin through a current limiting resistor into a GPIO port. And they had one of the other pins connected to ground and the other one connected to VCC. And they would switch between these two. Does this make anyone nervous for any reason? Yeah. So this was maybe. Yeah, so, so the comment was there's no pull up or pull down resistor, which is kind of weird. And I agree. Uh, the reason this is a little scary is as this switch moves from one contact to the other contact, it's moving through some distance. And the amount of time that it takes for it to go from one contact to the other contact is from the microcontroller's perspective a long time and the whole time it just has a floating voltage which is undefined so it could be anything it could be changing which could lead to erroneous gpio events in the case that you were sampling the state of that switch quite quickly now in lab one you almost certainly didn't see a bug associated with this because of the speed with which we were sampling that uh that um switch you'd have to get super unlucky but just it's good practice to the fix to this would be to, let's see, suppose we left this one connected to ground, we might do something like make this a no connect and put a pull up resistor here. We would make this, in the case that we kept this connected to ground, we'd make that a pull up. So maybe we put like a 10K here or so. This way, when we were in this orientation, we'd have ground going into the GPIO port. And then as soon as we left that contact, the pull up would pull us high. So that the, the voltage on that pin was never floating. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I, it could be, I, this is just a common pull up value, it, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you, you could. It, but in the event that you're using a, sing, a single pull double throw switch. Right, well then you, can just, you can still leave the bottom point instead of the top. Yeah, you, you could, you could. I'm just making the point that you wouldn't have to, yeah. Okay. Is the triangle for power or? Power, sorry, PCC. Okay. 
<laughs> anyway, anyway, this is not, it, like I said, this almost certainly didn't cause anyone any bugs, but in a future application, it might. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Also, with regard to lab reports, I realized that your your week two, sorry, your lab two lab report is due for the Wednesday people. It's due on the Wednesday after fall break, which I think is mean. So let's push that back to. Let me think about it. So I'm going to push that due date back a few days so that folks can take a break over fall break. You should take a break over fall break to the extent that you're able. I know that you all take your work really seriously. It's important to take your breaks as seriously as you take your work, right? So if you are able to, if your other professors are merciful, take a break over fall break. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I want to start today. Before I get into lab three stuff, is there any Boyd stuff that people want to talk about? Any weird bugs, anything going on that people want to talk about related to Boyd's? Um, the reason I want to start talking about lab three, yeah. Um, what's the expensiveness of like, setting the value of an array? Like, what's the expensiveness of setting the value of an array? Of The question is, what's the relative expense of multiplication versus initializing an array? That's, uh, my hand, it will depend on the length of the array in all likelihood. Okay, yeah, so I'm just like trying to weigh the difference between like an arithmetic multiplication versus just like initializing something to an immediate I don't have an off the top of my head answer for you. Yeah, you could test it. If, if, if you're set up to test such a thing, you could time it and see. Other Boyd questions? Okay. Why do I like Boyd so much? <laughs> Okay, so the reason I'm gonna start talking about lab three is the Wednesday people will be finishing up lab two on Wednesday, which means you'll be starting lab three on Wednesday. So it's about the right time to start talking about it. There's also a lot of stuff going on in lab three. So I wanna make sure we have a few lectures to talk about the getting started stuff for everyone. Um, so that when people start working on it, they're in a good position to do so. So let me just pull up the write up for lab three here quickly and remind you what we'll be doing. So just as a reminder, lab three should, I hope, appeal to the robotics minded among you. So what we're gonna be doing in lab three is building the system that you see here. And the system that you see is a lever arm that's approximately a foot long, it's made of like a balsa wood. And at the end of that lever arm is a small DC motor on which we've attached a drone propeller. We're gonna drive that DC motor using a pulse width, modulation pulse width modulation signal from the microcontroller. And we'll use a, uh, a hardware peripheral in the microcontroller called the output compare module in order to generate that pulse width modulation signal. It's one that I talked a little bit about in lecture two, but that we'll talk a lot more about to remind folks. So we're driving this motor with a pulse width modulation signal generated by the microcontroller. The faster you spin it, the more lift you generate. So you lift the arm, right? It is pivoting about a low torque potentiometer mounted here on this piece of wood. You're gonna be building stuff in this lab with like screws and screwdrivers and stuff like that. So there's a low torque potentiometer here this is kind of an expensive component, so just be careful with it. Okay, every group's gonna get one of these. Please be careful with your low torque potentiometer. So the idea here is we, we can generate a PWM signal to change the speed of the motor. For each angle of the motor, there is a, an associated value of that potentiometer, right? So we can 
change the hover angle of the motor with the pulse width modulation signal. We measure its current position using the potentiometer. And then in the microcontroller, we have code that's running a, a control algorithm, a PID controller that takes as input the current hover angle, the measured potentiometer value, compares that to the desired hover angle as specified by the user, and turns that difference into a control input to the motor to move the motor to some desired angle. Okay, yeah. So yes, um, the way that you will interact with this system is through a similar software interface, a Python interface. In that software interface, you should be able to enter a desired hover angle and that angle will immediately be obtained here by the motor. And you should also be able to update the, the controller gains. We're gonna be using a PID controller. So the proportional integral and derivative gains, you should be able to update in real time however you would like, right? And part of this lab is uh, I am not specifying what the user interface should look like. I would like for you to think about it. How, what is the best user interface for a system like this? The one that makes the most sense to you. And part of your evaluation is how good is your interface? And the reason we're lifting that constraint is because this is the last one before final projects where, you know, you really got to think about this stuff. Um, so there's a lot going on here, right? So, so in, you're going to be building quite a bit of external circuitry to drive this whole thing as well. Associated with the motor, there's a motor control circuit, and there's also a circuit in place to isolate the motor from the PIC32 and from other elements of the, of the circuit here. Because as we'll talk about, these motors kick up unbelievable amounts of noise. Um, if you allow for your DC motor to share power and ground with your microcontroller, and you don't do any noise consideration stuff at all, no filtering, no nothing. It's enough noise to reset your CPU a thousand times a second, right? So we really have to be careful with this. And we're gonna talk through the circuit that we have in place to protect everything from the motor. Um, and there's, some also, there's also some external circuitry associated with the potentiometer to low pass the input that's going into the ADC and to set up a, uh, an op amp buffer for that input into the ADC. So, what it, so what's the goal gonna be? You're gonna build this whole thing. When you push reset, the arm is going to automatically go through a maneuver. So it's gonna go from hanging straight down to hover, plus 30, minus 30, hover. And after it's executed that maneuver, you should be able to punch in whatever angle you want and it'll, it'll achieve it. This is a tricky system to control, right? It's a, it's a, a non-linear system in the sense that as the angle of this arm changes, the same delta in motor speed does not produce the same delta in angle. And it gets harder to control as the motor gets higher, right? So I will be interested to see what's the highest angle that each group is able to control. It gets quite difficult. Um, this also makes it important to I don't have it here, I should, but every group will have to set up a rotation stop of some sort so that the motor can't go wham back into the table because I promise you that the first few times that you fired this up, it's just gonna slam over. And unless you have a rotation stop there, it's gonna hit the table, which isn't dangerous, but might break your arm, might break the motor, which is annoying. No, no. <laughs> The, the motor won't hurt you too badly. Uh, so I think, I, I think I mentioned this in one of the first lectures. We've done the experiment of run at full speed and stick your finger in it, and it hurts. So, you know, it's not comfortable, but it doesn't break the skin. But don't, like, put your eyeball over the motor and <laughs> drive it up into it, right? So exercise just a little bit of common sense, but it's a safe, it's a safe motor. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of topics to cover here. So what, what are we going to cover here in lab three? Um, we're going to cover DC motors because I talked about the noise that they kick up. In order to understand the filter for protecting the system from that noise, we have to understand that noise. The noise comes from the internal mechanism of the motor itself. So we're going to talk about the internal mechanism 
understand the noise that those mechanisms generate and then discuss the circuits that we build to protect from that noise. So that's one element. Also associated with the motor is the output compare module in the PIC32. So we're gonna discuss that hardware peripheral in the PIC32. Um, we're gonna discuss the, the uh, low pass filter circuitry that we're gonna put between the potentiometer and the analog to digital converter input. And then we're gonna spend quite a bit of time also discussing the ADC on the PIC32, how to configure it, what its limitations are, that kind of thing. And then of course, um, we're gonna spend at least a lecture, probably two lectures discussing PID control algorithms, um, which is gonna be the actual software that's running on the PIC32. The, the code part of this lab, like the actual software that you write, as compared to something like Boyd's and even as compared to something like the Birdsong Lab is gonna be relatively compact, actually. You're gonna have a thread or a couple of threads that will be responsible for taking user input, changing gains, that kind of thing. And then you will have an ISR that is sampling the ADC, generating a control input and changing the PWM signal into the motor, right? So it's probably gonna be a thread or two that just takes in user input and an uh, interrupt service routine. And then ISR is gonna be running at something like mm, a kilohertz or so, relatively slow. So there's a lot to talk about. Let me just uh, scroll through this a little bit. Um, this is the, the simple voltage follower op amp circuit that we're gonna put in place between the low torque potentiometer and the ADC with a low pass filter in there. Um, you'll choose C in this to be the appropriate bandwidth for the, the problem that we're doing. And this is the motor circuit that we're gonna, we're gonna put in place to isolate the motor from the PIC32. We're gonna talk about this in detail. I just wanna point out a couple of things. The big thing that I wanna point out here is you can see that coming in from the PIC32 over here is the actual PWM control input. And that is going into a device called the 4N35, which is an opto isolator. So this is an integrated circuit that contains inside of it an LED and a phototransistor. What this allows for us to do is set up the microcontroller circuit on a the microcontroller on a completely separate circuit, different power, different ground than the motor. So we send PWM signals to blink this LED at a certain speed. Those flashes are picked up by the phototransistor, right? Which allows for us to communicate control, communicate input from the microcontroller circuit to the motor circuit through light, through photons, as opposed to through electricity. Yeah. Is it like a strong state unit? It's a little, uh, we'll look at it in lab, but it's, it's a little, it's an integrated circuit. All the components in this little section here are pins on this integrated circuit. So there's an input to the LED, a ground, and then the associated uh, um, inputs and outputs associated with this phototransistor. Some things to be careful of. When you're testing this, you will not <laughs> have one lead of your oscilloscope hooked up to ground over here and another lead hooked up to ground over here because the ground of your oscilloscope for both channels are internally shorted, right? So if you hook up a scope lead to this circuit and a scope lead to this circuit with grounds connected, you're connecting the grounds of these two circuits, right? And eliminating a lot of the isolation. Just be cautious about that. And we're gonna spend, if we have time today and definitely next time, this is the, the first circuit I wanna spend time looking at. Um, and then the other thing that you'll have to do in this lab is a, a little bit of mechanical construction. Um, so you're gonna get one of these arms, you'll hot glue a little motor at the end of this and put a drone propeller on it. Um, a lot of these are actually already assembled. So you may not have to put this together yourself because in previous years we've had students use hot glue as the connection mechanism between these things. We don't break them apart, right? So, this particular component, you might 
that get fully assembled. But you'll have to assemble the rest. So we have some angle brackets into which you can place the low torque potentiometers. You'll screw these into a piece of wood that we'll provide so that you can place it at the end of a table and use something to weight it down. So you want a piece of wood that's large enough to accommodate like a book on top of it or something. Um, and then you'll attach one to the other and um, set up the associated circuitry. This is one of those labs where you have to be conscious of, of physical layout because you are using an ADC to sample the position of this motor and you're using a relatively high speed PWM signal to drive the motor. If you put those ADC wires too close to the PWM wires, there's gonna be electromagnetic coupling between them and you are going to screw up your ADC measurements perhaps to the point of instability. So you have to be conscious of physical layout as you're putting this together. The physics actually matters here. So you can't just naively throw this thing together. You have to be conscious of where the wires are going and how you're putting it together. Let's see. Um, the mechanical construction part is basically directions following. So I'm not gonna spend time in lab go or in lecture going over that. There is a, uh, a simulation provided here so that you can start playing with the controller before you have the whole thing built if you would like to. Um, we'll talk through each of the pieces of this. So there's quite a number of pieces. However, you can build and unit test a lot of these pieces separately. So you can build and test the motor circuit right? You can build and test this circuit. And if you want to test it with a PWM signal, there's a, there's a function generator on each of your benches. So you can use that function generator to generate a square wave to test this whole thing. So you can test this on its own. You can test the, um, the low pass filter up here on its own by hooking up the potentiometer and moving it around and seeing the scope trace, right? So this is what the rest of today is going to be about. But, but what's happening here is we're sending a pulse width modulation signal into the opto isolator, which is pulsing this LED. That's creating current onto the base of this transistor, just turning it on and off. This resistor here is controlling how quickly that current leaks off the base. So this sets the bandwidth, so to speak, of the uh, opto isolator. A little bit of current passes here triggers the, the MOSFET, which uh, um, pulse width modulates the current through the motor. There is, but not that's long enough that we have to worry about it in our control. It's longer than the MOSFET. Like it's the, that's what's in there, the MOSFET is faster. Yes, yes, yes. This this is the speed limiting mechanism here. Yeah. Are you going to just hold the PWM signal there too? Because we want to electrically isolate the motor from the microcontroller. For a bunch of reasons, which I'll I'll talk about just now, unless there are any questions about this. If we were to control a servo, those, they're a bit safer. Still, a servo is essentially a DC motor with an internal uh, feedback mechanism in it. We can, we'll, we'll do a lecture on these. Yeah. Okay. Questions about the objectives here, like the large scale, what we're doing, what the goals are. It's a little constrained helicopter. Okay. So then how to start, how to start this lab. I would start with the mechanical construction. Okay, that's largely directions following. And then the next thing that I would do is build this circuit and build the 
op amp circuit and test each of those. So because this is one of the first things that I imagine many people will be doing in lab, I wanna spend some time today talking through this circuit. And as I mentioned, the reason that this circuit is what it is, is largely because of, or entirely because of the noise kicked up by these DC motor. And in order to understand that noise, we have to talk a little bit about how DC motors work. So I wanna just take a few minutes to do that. So this is stuff that many of you likely already know, okay? But I just will remind you how a DC motor works. In the, the particular flavor of DC motor that we're using in this lab is a brushed DC motor. So the way that these motors work is we set up some static magnetic field it's called the stator field. In our motors, this is set up with two permanent magnets. Okay, so these two permanent magnets are setting up a static uh, magnetic field inside of the motor. We place current through an armature here so currents flowing through this coil of wire called an armature. You'll remember from, gosh, e and whichever physics class that was, freshman year, sophomore year, that from the Lorentz force, right, if you put current through a loop of wire in a magnetic field, it feels a torque, right? In fact, it, it feels a mu cross B torque. So if we had current flowing this way through this field, then our mu is down, our B is, let's see, mu is down, B is this way. So we get a torque out of the screen. So the motor starts to spin this way, right? Once it's upside down though, the, the problem that I'll talk about the solution for in a moment is if the current were still flowing in the same direction, then once this flips 180 degrees, our current would be this way. Our field is still, this way, so we end up with torque into the board. So this commutator does a few things. Let's see, is this an animation? I think it is, hold on. Uh, yeah, okay, so the motor's spinning, okay. This commutator is a mechanism that allows for this motor to spin while maintaining electrical connection to the armature, right? Because we can't just use wires here because they twist themselves up almost immediately, right? So the armature can spin on top of this commutator and the commutator here is split into two sections so that every 180 degrees, the current through the armature switches direction so that the torque stays in the same direction as the thing rotates. Yeah. You, so the, the commutator automatic, you apply DC current to the commutator. As it rotates, the construction of the commutator automatically switches the direction of current through the, uh, through the armature. So that's taken care of by the motor. Kind of interesting here though. You can see that for a particular orientation in this animation, it's when the, uh, when the armature is directly vertical you have a torque minimum, All right? So this is, this is what's called torque ripple in the DC motor, where the torque output from the motor is not constant as the motor rotates. There's orientations for which the torque is maximum and or orientations for which the torque is at a minimum. Yeah. In, it, in this animation, it could be in the sort of DC motor that you would buy off the shelf, they are constructed in such a way that they aren't, they, they can't get stuck. And the way that they actually do that is this commutator, just for simplicity of demonstrating the, the principle here is divided into two sections. A lot of the off the shelf DC motors will divide the commutator into more sections so that, so that there is never an orientation of the commutator here where these two leads from the input aren't in contact with the part of the commute with the commutator so that it's sending current into the um into the armature i did not explain that clearly at all 
Okay. <laughs> let me let, let me come up with some animations of this and send it to you offline. I'm having trouble waving my hands at that explanation. The short answer is yes, but in practice, no, for reasons that I will make clear offline. Yeah. In this animation, is it possible for In the other direction, you mean? Yeah, the way that we would do that is these little yellow dots are demonstrating the direction of the DC current. If we switch that, then it would spin the other way. Okay. Um, anything else I wanted to mention about this? So, okay, so this is, this is an animation showing a brushed DC motor where what that means is the stator field is constant and we're changing the direction of current through the armature. You might also see uh, brushless DC motors where the, instead of manipulating the current through the armature here, the, uh, the magnet external stator field is manipulated. Okay. Um, I want to talk briefly about this notion of back EMF. Um, so the model that folks use to describe a, a um, the model that folks use to describe a DC motor, generally speaking, is where you see a DC motor in some electrical schematic, you can, to a relatively good approximation, replace that symbol with a resistor in series with an inductor in series with a generator. And the reason the resistor is included in there is because these motors have some resistance. The reason the inductor is included in there is because somewhere in this motor, in this case, it's in the armature, there are loops of wire which carry inductance, right? So there's a resistor in series with an inductor. And then there's a generator because of this effect back EMF, which I wanna talk about just a little bit. Um, this is a coil of wire spinning in a magnetic field, which again, you'll remember for physics is how a generator works, right? So as this thing is rotating, it is, the rotation of this coil in this magnetic field is, the, a, a current is getting induced on the coil that opposes the applied current, right? And this acts as a feedback mechanism for regulating the torque output of the motor. So how to think about this? Let's say we apply some voltage to the DC motor. It starts spinning at some rate. It's gonna spin up and then hit some constant rate at which it's spinning. And when it's spinning at that constant rate, the, the back EMF is approximately matching the applied voltage, which is to say we're applying some current. The amount of current that's getting generated on the armature is opposing that current and they approximately, approximately match. So it's spinning at a constant speed. What, were to hap what would happen if we were to grab the armature of the motor and slow it down? Well, then all of the sudden, the armature would be spinning less quickly. So the current induced on the armature would be less. We would still be applying the same voltage to the motor. So suddenly more current would be allowed to flow through the armature because there's less opposing current fighting it. So we would get more torque out of the motor and it would fight back against us. So as you grab the motor, as you try to slow it down, this back EMF, you reduce, you reduce the, induced, uh, the induced current on the armature, which allows for more current to flow through the armature in the direction that you're applying it, which creates more torque, which fights back against you. And conversely, okay, Suppose that we had been holding it for a while, it's spinning at its new constant rate, and then we let go. We reduce the load on the motor. Well, then all of the sudden, the armature is allowed to spin more quickly. We get more current fighting back against us, right? And it regulates in the opposite direction. Torque is reduced, speed is increased. So it's, it's an automatic feedback mechanism for controlling the torque, this back EMF. And that's the reason that in that, uh, that's the reason for the generator symbol 
in the approximation of a DC motor as a resistor inductor generator. What I want to talk about next is the reasons that this construction leads to stuff that we have to be careful about. So we have to protect the CPU and the rest of the circuit from the motor because it's creating a huge amount of noise. The reason for that is, as I just said, we approximate the motor by a resistor and inductor and a generator. And you will remember, you will remember from like your physics or your first circuits class that the voltage across the inductor is given by LDIDT, the inductance multiplied by the rate of change of current across that motor, right? So suppose that we are pulse width modulating the motor or alternatively, suppose that the direction of current through this armature, which is an inductor is changing quickly, which it is because as this rotates every 180 degrees, the commutator here is changing the direction of current through that armature, right? So that's a big, big DIDT. So we have these big DIDTs. So even for a modest inductance, say 10 to the minus three Henry, maybe like a milli Henry, the, the current through that armature can be changing on the order of, you know, tens of nanoseconds or so. So you're looking at these very, very large volt, voltage spikes from this LDIDT term as a consequence of the fact that the direction of current in that armature is changing quickly. So we will see when we run the motor, if you were to just fire up the motor, I'm gonna ask everyone to do this by the way, because it's, it's so interesting to look at. Fire up the motor, take a scope and just look at the voltage across the motor and look at the spikes coming off of it. It's insane. It's, and it's because of these rapid changes in current through the motor. So you get these big voltage spikes and you get these big, changes in motor polarity. If we're not careful, this can be very destructive. Very, very destructive. At best, causing lots of resets, at worst, destroying things. Yeah. So is it given the lightning attitude of connectivity and the supply of the MOSFET gate, if you impose that spike with a low high frequency, so the spike can travel at that same rate? It sure can. And in fact, the noise generated by that armature in particular is up in like the RF levels of bandwidth. Really, really high bandwidth noise, okay. really high frequency noise. So, so like yeah. So it's radiating power. These DC motors can radiate power in the megahertz range which is like about the same speed as the CPU clock. So it can do <laughs> unusual things to your CPU if you're not careful. Also, it means that the noise can be coupled in ways which you don't expect through the breadboards. Like it, yeah. Is it not much smaller than one amp? Like you go from zero to ten, so very small. Well, if you're running this motor at full speed, it draws about an amp. Yeah. Yeah. So for power supply, we're using the, the AC adapter we plug into the wall to run both the microcontroller and the motor. No, that's a good question. So you will power the the microcontroller, the op amp, the potentiometer, etc., will all be powered using ultimately the, the the power jack that you plugged into the wall, and then by breaking out from the big board. The motor is powered from the bench power supply. So we have these big spikes, big voltage spikes, reversals in, vo in, uh, in voltage polarity. So one of the things that we put in place to protect our circuit from the motor are these snubber diodes. So we put in parallel with the motor, a diode in an orientation that points from the low side of the motor to the high side of the motor so that when the voltage across this motor briefly reverses polarity, there's a safe loop through which that current can travel. We use in 
In lab three, we'll use a 1N4001, which is kind of like a physically beefy diode that can accommodate the amount of current that would be expected through that loop. If you're not careful with sizing your diode, you can just get a really hot component in your circuit. The other thing that we put in place is a bypass cap, um, which allows a path to ground for some of the really high frequency noise coming mostly from the commutator switching the direction of current through that armature. That's producing the tremendously high frequency noise. This, this bypass cap reduces the amount of noise that the rest of the circuit sees. This one is particularly interesting to fire up the motor, look at the, the voltage across it and observe the spikes and then place the bypass cap in parallel with it. And you'll see the spikes just go whoop. They don't disappear, but they get way smaller. It's a really compelling visual thing to look at. I do it here, but it's hard to carry all that stuff down here. Even with this stuff though, even with this stuff, uh, it, it's a good idea to completely electrically isolate the motor from the CPU, which is why we use that electrical isolator. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you isolate it if you are building a system that has the if you're building a system that has only one power source, how do you electrically isolate one from the other? I don't have a short answer for you. Hmm. So, if we look again, you could do such things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, if we look again at the the schematic for the circuit that you'll be building to to power and control this motor. Some of this stuff will hopefully make a bit more sense. Um, the motor is powered by the bench supply. So this is bench ground and bench power, which is separate from microcontroller ground and microcontroller power. We have the motor in parallel with the motor is a bypass cap. And in parallel with both is a snubber diode in the proper orientation. All of these are in series with a MOSFET, which is the mechanism which is the component that we use to actually pulse width modulate the current through the motor. This MOSFET is driven by a phototransistor, the 4N35, which is an opto isolator. So it's both the LED and phototransistor in one package. And this is in series with a, a, a 10K resistor just to avoid shorting power to ground in the event that you turn on the transistor. And Coming off the base of this transistor is a resistor who, that you will size to match the desired bandwidth that you need for this control system. You wanna be able to toggle this thing at about a kilohertz. So let's see. So if this were too low, if this resistance were too low, you would never be able to generate enough current into the base to turn on that transistor. If that were too high, you would drop your bandwidth. Start with like a mega ohm, not a mega ohm. A whole mega ohm. And you'll put a 300 ohm resistor in series with the uh, opto isolator LED. So, yeah. Yes. So how will you test this? Well, you'll build this circuit and you'll start by driving this with the function generator. 
You don't need your microcontroller working, your code working yet to test this circuit. You can test this circuit with the lab equipment. So you'll test this with the function generator. Incidentally, in this lab, one of the other requirements is uh, you'll be sending two values to the DAC. One of the values that you'll be sending to the DAC is the potentiometer voltage so that you can have a visual display of the angle of the motor. And the other value that you'll be sending to the DAC is a, uh, the control input to the motor which you'll low pass, otherwise it's gonna be crazy spiky. But we wanna be able to look at the scope and see both the state of the lever arm, the angle of the lever arm, and the control input to the motor. And once you have the whole thing connected, that is the first thing that you'll get working because it will make debugging way easier if you can see those two things. So we're not using the DAC to produce sound in this lab, we're using it as a debugging tool. Questions? The lab is going to sound like a swarm of bees. <laughs> Watch all these things get fired up. They get loud. <laughs> okay. The birds and the bees. <laughs> So uh, I will be in lab this afternoon. I'm going to open it up at three. I will be there. It'll stay open until six. I'll be kind of in and out of lab today, but it'll be open the whole time. So if people want to come and work, I'll be popping in. I just have a few meetings I have to do today. Uh, but lab will be open today at three until about six. So you're welcome to come work on voids or wherever you are. Work on whatever you want. Okay. Thank you very much.